who is the founder and director of InfoCulture, a startup offering support and facilitation for organizations, teams, and leaders in digital transformation. Uh, Steve also participated in the Edison project on data science, right. which coincidentally I had some involvement with and was very right. impressed by. Um, so today's webinar will focus on data science skills and competencies required by data-driven organizations. And so with that, I'll turn the uh, virtual podium over to Steve Brewer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, for that introduction. Uh, and thank you very much, guys, to the, for the input, uh, invitation to, to speak today and present this webinar, which I'm very pleased to do. It um, enables me to bring together uh, a range of things that I've been involved in uh, over recent years uh, and further get to grips with, with WCOR metadata, which is something, whilst I'm not a um, uh, hugely familiar with it. it, it's something that the topic that's been um, sort of on the periphery of quite a few things I've been involved in for the last few years. So um, I'm going to be talking um, about uh, a few different initiatives I've been involved in, but mainly the Edison project, EU project, uh, and I'm very much um, drawing upon the, the contributions of the the team members of the Edison project and, and many other people, including Paul, as he says, who have attended workshops and conferences that we ran. So it's very much a collaborative process. Uh, and really, all I'm doing is bringing some of that information together and um, really sharing it. So in terms of the, the, the outline of what I'd like to talk about today, uh, I'm going to say something of an introduction to in, uh, explain what I think are the benefits and opportunities that increasing uh, use of data uh, provides. Um, we can have a look at the, the whole the concept of data and metadata and how it, how it fits into this, this emerging model. I'll be saying a lot more about the, the, the Edison project and how that fits into this um, evolution of, of the world. And then finally, quite briefly really, some con con conclusions and um, action points that, you know, that we, we collectively can think about taking forwards. So the, the world is changing and many areas and sectors are being forced to rethink how they operate. This disruption is being driven and also enabled by data. So we talk about the process of digitalization. What we really mean is the transformation to data-driven systems and processes. Whilst many organizations and services are transforming parts of their, their whole approach, the real challenge of digitalization is coming up with a, an overarching vision for everything. Speaking as somebody who used to work in academic library information services over 20 years ago, at the time of the early years of the World Wide Web, I can recall how academic libraries embraced this transformation process. Information professionals obviously have a head start on others in terms of understanding the importance of managing and curating good quality data but they have been equally sensitive to the challenges of welcoming change. Many areas from scientific discovery to manufacturing, from city management to retail, have been radically transformed by the use of data. In addition to driving innovation in traditional practices through increased use of data capture to refine services, this has also ushered in new business models. And many of these are based around the platform model. Examples of this are Amazon, Booking.com, eBay, etc. These platforms are arguably implementing traditional market models that have existed for thousands of years. The use of big data simply enables those models to operate at degrees of scale unheard of in human history. However, new business models are developing that do transform these traditional practices. A good example of this transformation of traditional manufacturing industries from selling products made in factories to offering services that their customers can subscribe to without actually taking ownership of physical goods. One of the most well-known examples of this is Rolls-Royce, the engine manufacturer, who offer engine thrust as a service rather than selling airline engines for their aircraft. So previously, the company had made money from expensive maintenance contracts. But with a service contract, they have an incentive to design and produce products to a much higher degree of reliability and resilience. And these benefits are achieved through Rolls-Royce capturing large amounts of data, relevant data, from sensors 
on their engines whilst in use. And this can inform them about potential faults before they become a liability to the company. An added bonus of this collaborative approach is that there's less waste over time because it's in everybody's interest. The products function really well. And there are other examples of this data-driven model. But the key thing to understand is that data-driven approaches are creating and enabling innovation and opportunity in many areas. So this, of course, raises questions about ownership of the data, curation of the data. And we see this in many different business sectors, aeronautics, agriculture, pharmaceuticals, entertainment, and government too. All of them need to raise their game in terms of data management. Because these business models enable new strategies for the operation of the organizations and the ability to understand and fully appreciate the potential and reliability of data is critical to the success. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be focusing on the EU funded Edison project because this, I think, forms uh, a basis for how we can move forward in supporting different areas in the uh, use of, of, of data. And the idea that a common and agreed framework of skills and competences has huge benefits for these areas, as well as in science, uh, scientific research, which is where the, the origins of the project lie. So we can look at the, the needs and the opportunities for the roles of everybody from data curators to strategic leaders in organizations who need to understand data science, the role of data science, and people working in this area. We can also appreciate that a robust and proven schema for core data, the Dublin Core offers, is a firm foundation for capturing the value that multiple interoperable data collections can offer. So the, the Edison project ran from September 2015 for two years and involved a series of workshops and conferences. And these led to collaboratively creating a valuable practical framework that continues to be developed and exploited. Um, so I move on to the, uh, the slide that introduces the Edison project. Um, so whilst the project does not offer data science courses um, on the skills itself, Edison does offer a model curricula as a starting point as part of the framework, which a number of organisations ranging from university departments to commercial businesses have already found useful to uh, develop resources within their own organisations. Um, the slides there mentions Yuri Demchenko, who was the lead of the project based at the University of Amsterdam. Many others were involved uh, from across Europe, uh, but Yuri also continues to take the lead on coordinating resources from Amsterdam, which we'll come back to later. So in terms of uh, an overview of what the Edison project um, contributed, the, the, the background to this was uh, a need to look at data-driven research and the demand for new skills, particularly uh, in research infrastructures, um, such as the European grid infrastructure, uh, resources at CERN, uh, and many other sites across Europe. The, the framework was developed uh, to, to map the, the data science competences and skills that were needed uh, and delved into what, what that role entailed. Interestingly, one of the key conclusions of the project, which emerged quite early, is that there is, in a sense, much more than the, the, the single um, specialist data scientist. It's really what we call a, a team sport. It's, it's, it's a role of which um, different individuals would, would carry uh, different uh, combinations of skills from that profile. Once the frame, as the framework was developed, we looked at the professional profiles that needed to be modelled. Uh, and also developed a body of knowledge uh, and a model curriculum to capture this. Uh, and then this was used to think about how teams could be designed uh, and constructed uh, and managed and led to, to develop, in the first instance, new approaches to science, but as we expanded this to other, other perspectives on business. And then we can look at some recommendations and uh, additional materials. So, what was the background to this? What, what were the drivers to this thought or this idea that, that data-driven science was the future? 
Well, there have been quite a few uh, investigations and notably some high profile books, such as the book of Paradigm, um, co-edited with, with Tony Hay from Microsoft and others, um, which really looked at some of the ideas uh, about data intensive scientific discovery. And in terms of the European perspective on this, there's a extremely valuable report um, produced um, by John Wood and others called Riding the Wave. And that, that was um, a very so, so useful, but it's more than useful, it was quite inspirational book on and set, agenda setting book on the strategy needed by quite a few different uh, scientific domains in terms of how scientific data was being used to drive forwards uh, different aspects of science. And this was certainly very uh, influential on the early days of the European grid infrastructure, for example, as we look to reach out to different communities, scientific communities across Europe. And there was a follow on report on data harvest. Um, the European Open Science Cloud, which is sort of been, is ongoing now, that obviously uh, takes forwards the ideas of, of uh, data related to science being extremely important in terms of driving things forwards. The, uh, the, Go, the Go Fair initiative and other um, fair related um, initiatives have, are ongoing and um, many of you will be familiar with those from the UK, European Open Science Cloud uh, and other projects across Europe. So when we talk about fair data, uh, it's an acronym related to findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, which is a very succinct way of looking at the, the, the benefits and the uh, opportunities for using data in an open data world. Um, now, of course, that in itself raises a number of questions about what is open data, what is closed data, but leaving that, that discussion around aside for another day, um, the important point is that there's a lot of initiatives building upon the, the, the value of using data in science. Um, the, the report also draws upon the need for the data stewardship role. And this is quite important because it's a significant, um, from an Edison perspective, subset of the data science skill set. So whereas we can look at, we'll look in a second at what, what a data scientist is, but the data stewardship role, which was identified by Baron Mons and the others as being critical to the future of uh, scientific discovery in having individuals with particular expertise at curating, uh, looking after uh, and, and uh, making available data within research teams uh, and projects, etc. There's some links there if you, if you want to follow that up. We also, um, in terms of doing the research at the, well, not just the start of the project, but ongoing, looked at uh, existing reports that have been done from across Europe and US and elsewhere in the world on the, the, the need for uh, the shortages of data science skills that have been uh, identified. Uh, you can read those for yourselves, but the, the key point is that there's, there was an awareness uh, of a significant shortage and projections for an ongoing shortages in these areas. It's quite interesting as we move, as, as trends change, for example, at the moment, there's much more of a buzz around artificial intelligence, machine learning and such like. But all of these um, new technologies are predicated on what we would call data science skills. So the, the, the predictions seem to be proved correct, um, but we, we need to be aware that the, the context for where people are looking will, be, will evolve as, as trends change. Here's an example of some of the research data that we looked at in terms of the breaking down the, the different subsets of uh, data science umbrella um, skills uh, needed. Leave those for yourselves. But the key point is that there's significant demand across a number of areas. And obviously these are, whilst on, at a headline level, different roles, they're clearly roles that need to, need to people that need to collaborate and be, be speaking the same language. So as we, we looked at the, the need, the demand that was out there, and at the same time started to look at the, uh, the initial offerings that were already 
available across Europe and in fact elsewhere in terms of courses and training because our the mission of the Edison project was, was to reduce the gap that exists between the offerings and the, and the demands of employers. We needed to break down some of the key terms and understand exactly what they meant. So the difference between education and training, for example, where, where training is a short-term solution typically done in a workplace environment, uh, whereas education is obviously done in a learning environment and the basis for sustainable skills development. Of course, in reality, we need a combination of the two to develop the actual competencies, the practical <coughs> abilities to, 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 to um, undertake work. So with some frightening statistics emerge about 50% uh, of academic curricula outdated at the time of graduation. We all know about that. The skills that you learn at university are not designed as, as, as training skills so much as deep uh, sort of philosophical underpinnings that will guide you through life. But that, of course, doesn't address the data science challenge. Um, we, we come to further conclusions about the lack of necessary skills to um, deal with, with, with problems. And the, the, the more complex is the relationship between um, policy makers and decision makers in terms of understanding the, the, the skills needed to actually execute um, future initiatives, projects, etc. And quite critical for that is the, the, the strategy towards uh, education and learning and training uh, approaches. Um, we talked about self-reskilling, we're, we're talking about the challenges around lifelong learning, the move from a traditional model where people perhaps go to university, learn some, uh, learn some things for three or four years, and then go out into the workplace uh, and are you know, useful uh, working citizens. But of course, with a, in the fast-moving world that we increasingly are part of in terms of use of data, et cetera, we find that this uh, lifelong learning demands are, are only going to increase. So we, we have to think about, or there is a need to think about where, where, how these skills and lifelong training is going to be supported. Are people going to be doing studying MOOCs and online courses in the evenings and weekends, or are they going to be taking time off each year to to upskill and develop uh, professional competences. This is, these are big questions that need to be addressed. And of course, we've talked about the millennials factor. Um, as each young, younger generation comes through, their, their demands, their needs, their capabilities, their, their philosophies, their outlooks on the world, um, their ethical perspectives are all significantly different. Um, and that in turn creates changes in the workforce which need to be addressed. So this, the, the Edison project facing this, this background of information set out to do a number of things um, to design a framework that would capture uh, in a way that was very useful strategically um, some of the ideas around these skills and what could be done to look at the role of data science and to look at how the teams can be put together and interoperate around the, the shared data. So here we have a high-level overview schematic of, of the data science framework. Um, what you see certainly on the left is a collection of uh, things that make up the data science framework, which is the um, sort of acronyms here, I'm afraid, the competence framework for data science. The BOK is the body of knowledge, which captures what the elements there. We've got the MC, which is the, the, the model curriculum, which is a starting point for those wishing to develop courses. Um, and the professional profiles, um, all of which uh, were, were connected together through the, um, the taxonomy uh, or vocabulary that was, was, was um, developed to, to ensure that we're using consistent terminology. Um, and then moving to the right, there were various um, services, if you like, that were developed, um, some only at a sort of prototype level to present and make available uh, this information and connect it um, to the, the wider world for use. Um, and a lot of this involved our mechanisms for working with the community through conferences and workshops to, to fine tune uh, and define this. This, this very much was, was, was a proof of concept that was, was developed while the project was going on. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that there's a lot of opportunity 
for developing this uh, further in the future. So what challenges related to skills management can the framework help to address? Well, for guiding researchers in using the right methods and tools in terms of data and analytics, uh, in terms of extracting value from their scientific data. Uh, at the moment, a lot of uh, approaches to data science in, in, within different scientific disciplines are developed either in an ad hoc way or perhaps in quite a niche way for a particular area, which is fine and works, but it can present challenges when you start to get collaborative interdisciplinary approaches um, where perhaps they have got different uh, standards and approaches to managing and looking after and extracting value, research value from, from data. Um, there is the need to train the, the experts, the research infrastructure engineers who will be building and developing more intensive research infrastructures in the future. There is the constant development of the tools um, and the ability to reuse tools that are extracting, that are being used to uh, conduct research with the data. There is the issue we've spoken about, the data steward role. Um, many research teams, research organizations have data stewards, maybe with other names, uh, and there's obviously potential benefits to um, at least sharing ideas on the, 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 the skills and competencies needed in this role. And the, a very important part of this is, is the, the strategic element of helping managers and senior people, strategists, policy makers, understand what's needed here in order to define the career paths of people in the future, uh, which includes uh, training, professional training, and such like. So the project was, was focused on research infrastructures. It, it emerged from that particular uh, director of the commission, if, you, if you're, you're into that kind of jargon version, EU, but the, the key point is that what was quickly identified is that whilst these challenges were present in the research world, they were equally present in the business world. Uh, and that is an important thing to understand because the research, the business world, sorry, presents a lucrative draw to people who have these skills in the research world. And so it's, it's necessary to understand that to formally be able to train up new people as, as, as people passing through potentially um, from jobs in one area to uh, other different jobs in the, in the business world. Um, so there's a need to structure that process. And that's a good thing, a good thing. So in order to break down the, what we mean by competencies and skills, we, we wanted to just clarify our understanding of this. And what we're talking about is the, the ability to perform organizational functions. And this takes a combination of things. So competence is in fact a combination of a knowledge, deep understanding of, of what's going on, coupled with the practical skills to do that thing. And as we, we mentioned earlier, this is a combination of education in terms of knowing these things uh, and experience, which only, which only workplace training of some kind can give you. And that in turn, makes turns enables people to become uh, useful uh, functionaries in the workplace or the research environment and ultimately develop professional profiles as these these uh, these competencies are formalized in some way now what do we mean by a data scientist um, th this in itself is it was a challenging thing um, we spent a long time both ourselves within the project and also at um, the various workshops and conferences discussing this. And in a nutshell, we came down with the idea there isn't a better term for the thing that we're talking about. Now, we, we realized that in a business environment, the, the term scientist might be seen as unhelpful. Um, it might be seen as unhelpful by some in the research world. But the fact is, it's the combination of the two words, data and scientist, is important. Clearly, what we're talking about is data and the ability to handle data. And the term scientist uh, is a reflection on the fact that a, a scientific process is going on in terms of making use of the data, in terms of understanding it, uh, curating it, uh, and being rigorous and or methodical in terms of um, extracting or attempting to extract value from that. 
So hence we have this uh, starting point of a definition uh, based on the American standard. A data scientist is a practitioner who has sufficient knowledge of the overlapping regimes of expertise and business needs, domain knowledge, analytical skills and programming, systems engineering, manage end-to-end -end scientific method process for each stage in the big data life cycle until the delivery of expected scientific and business value to an organization. In other words, it's all about the ability to make decisions. Um, and that's, that's it. if you wanted a shorter summary, it's this ability to use data to make decisions. And then we go on to, to break that down into different areas. So we have the, the competencies and skills across analytics, engineering, uh, and domain knowledge. And what we mean by that is the, the, the range of statistical, mathematical, uh, and processes that are needed. The engineering, we're talking about the, the computational skills in managing data, storing data safely and securely. And thirdly, domain knowledge. And by this, we what, what emerged from the field work, the, the research was that having domain knowledge in some area or other, whether it's uh, abstract physics or geology, etc., enable practitioners to have that understanding of the scientific method to be rigorous in their use and exploitation of the data. So those three broad areas were, were, were found to be uh, critical to this, this, this role. And we also uh, added two extra compass groups which came out of the work, which was the, the data management range of uh, skills in terms of curating the data, if you like, stewarding the data, and the, the, the research methods and business processes. So, in order to be a useful data scientist, you, you need these research methods uh, understood, which is uh, related to the data domain knowledge or and or the business processes. So in, in a more business context, what is it you're actually going to do with uh, the data? And thirdly, and this, this, this came through perhaps towards the latter part of the project as we were refining the framework with, with um, people that attended, more stakeholders as we, we got to know them through the um, engagement uh, events, is data science professional skills. Um, it's about thinking and acting like a data scientist. We'll come back to this. Um, we related this as what used to be called soft skills. I like to think of them as leadership skills. We'll talk about leadership uh, in, the, in the context of data. It's very important because it's the idea of, of being either empowered or confident to, to speak up and uh, make assertions about what you've learned from the data as opposed to just being for example, a business intelligence role where you're reporting back or you're, you have been delegated to answer questions. The, the key difference for data scientists is that ability to uh, assert things that have emerged from the, the data. Uh, another term which we, we've ended up using, which is, is more prevalent in the United States, is 21st century skills. Uh, you can criticize all of these, but these are, these are terms that are emergent and uh, prevalent in the, in the research literature. So we created this overarching uh, picture. Um, often it's criticized as not being a valid Venn diagram by statisticians, mathematicians, but it, it's, it's a picture of the, of the world. It's a map of the world of data science. Uh, and it really is conveying what, what I've just been talking about, this mixture of domain expertise, uh, analytics skills, and data engineering skills uh, in order to, to present this collection of skills and competencies that we're going to be talking about. And around the outside of those, those three intersecting um, circles is it, the, the research process from experiment design to data collection to analysis to um, extracting hypotheses and testing hypotheses, then wanting to collect more data and repeating the exercise. So this is a very familiar research um, process that we many people will be uh, familiar with. And then we can break down the, the intersecting skills in the sense there, um, which you can read for yourself on, on the right. But as I say, the project also branched out to look at the business world. And we, we replicated or further developed this, this model uh, to look at how this works in the business world. But of course, it's, it's, it's not really different 
um, there's still the idea of capturing data, optimizing the use of that data, designing um, experiments in the widest sense of the word, modeling perhaps processes, and then extracting uh, information from that, and then deciding what more data to capture. And this is a very high level view of this. But what's very interesting is when you look at the way businesses and industry are using data, um, this is the, the process that's going on. You will often see this written up as uh, uh, more data intensive looking at industrial processes, whether it's uh, engine design or automotive manufacturing, but the same thing's going on with, with capturing data, modeling the data, and extracting it. Uh, and then we need to, they need to know who, which people have the skills to do this. And it's the same combinations of domain expertise, uh, data, uh, data engineering. So please don't try and, well, you're welcome to try and read all the text on this, but what, this, what I wanted to uh, exemplify here is the idea of how these different families of skills can be broken down and uh, categorized. And this is what gets to the heart of what the framework does. And so the, the different areas that I've mentioned, data analytics, data, data software engineering, um, all, all, all can be broken down into different elements. Uh, and this then becomes useful in analyzing both roles and the skill sets of individuals in order to um, measure, uh, compare, and enhance them. Um, so this is it in a, in a more simplistic list. So you've got the, the different areas that I mentioned, um, and then we're breaking them down into experience, skills related to competencies, um, those skills based on practical workplace experiences. Um, so you've got the more theoretical approaches and the more practical people are used to specific databases um, and the, the 21st century skills I was talking about, which we'll come back to. And as, as we started to look at the professionalization of data science, we, we analyzed how being a professional is, 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 is much about acting and thinking like a, a professional. And so it's these other qualities of the individual recognizing the value of data, being able to go through this iterative development of refining positions, um, sense of metrics, sense of understanding the data, what it means that you know it's, data is not just numbers, it, it is things, and it's a question of understanding that. Being able to ask questions, interrogate, uh, and refine um, viewpoints, respect the domain and subject matter. So this is not talking about computer science or something like that, it's an abstract separate from uh, different domains, from the real world if you like, but it's actually deeply understanding the subject matter in which you're working in order to uh, better understand uh, the issues around the data. I like this phrase number six, having a data-driven, being a data-driven problem solver and having an impact driven mindset. Data science is about asking questions and answering questions uh, about discovery. So it, it's this, this mentality to be inquiring, and to dig in and extract value from data. And I think being well about power and limitations uh, is also important, especially as we move to the application of data science in the context of artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc., robotics. Um, there are ethical uh, and moral questions that need to be addressed as well. Uh, and there's more that. So, uh, the the making use of this uh, is it's a team. It's a team. It's a team sport. I like that phrase. It's a, it's a team sport. So we need uh, to develop in data scientists those wanting to work in this area the ability to um, work in that multidisciplinary environment, so the ability to communicate with others, either with data science skills uh, or with domain uh, expertise that is different to what the data scientist might have acquired initially, is very important. So as we develop the idea of data science as a profession, clearly the individuals need to be able to move potentially from one area to another, uh, and so the, the language and the ideas has to be um, fluid, flexible, and interoperable, which of course is related to what we're, we're talking about here in terms of uh, metadata, which we'll come to later. Um, 
working in an agile environment. I mean, this is interesting in the context of um, modern workplace, modern departments, in, in different contexts. You perhaps heard, probably heard of you know, agile approaches of the, uh, the lean startup approach, learning, rev rev revising, pivoting on ideas as you learn. Um, the, the, the workplace working practices are all evolving quite quickly. And so uh, it's very important that people working with data are familiar with these, uh, not just in the, the research environment, but also in the, in the wider world, potentially more, more, more so in the wider world. The use of narrative is very interesting, storytelling. So the ability to uh, use narrative to, to, to convey what lessons have been learned from uh, extracting meaning from data is, is something that came up quite a bit. Now this is still quite a controversial uh, perspective because on the one hand, um, using narrative storytelling to, to uh, convey uh, actionable results from analysis is, is a good thing, but equally we can think of many examples, uh, or at least the, the world of fake news, where that can be misused, where selectively uh, information is extracted from data and used in a uh, a less positive way. So there's, there's, uh, that has to be seen in the context of the, the big picture of uh, skill, skills and competences. Uh, the attitude thing is, is, is very important, the idea of creativity and curiosity, um, wanting to look for new uh, evidence, look for new meaning to be extracted from data is very important. So the data science role in the way it differs from perhaps traditional um, data management skills is that the individuals need to spend time exploring data uh, and trying different things rather than just be, for example, told to just go and extract what, what is this simple question and answer that question and move on. And as I've said, all of this brings together ethics and responsible use of data. 21st century skills, which came out of some work with um, some US-based projects, uh, was very relevant and um, there's, there's quite a few research papers that we drew upon to um, capture and articulate what, what these 21st century skills are. Critical thinking really conveys what I've just been talking about. Um, communication as well, so as, as, as Baron Mons put it in one of the workshops we attended, uh, he wants people to look at the screen with great focus but also look up from the screen and talk to people. Uh, and as I think we all know, these aren't necessarily uh, skill sets that uh, exist in everybody. Collaboration, um, again, a lot of traditional research about individuals working in a very focused uh, way alone, but a lot of this work requires deep collaboration, uh, and not only with fellow experts in the same field, but with others in different fields, which presents its own challenges. Creates Creativity and attitude we've been talking about. Planning an organization. Um, one of the uh, requirements of successful collaboration, of course, is planning an organization. It's not enough to um, just delve into it to, to an area on your own and just see where it leads you in order to coordinate things. A much higher degree of planning and organization is needed. And that's in turn takes planning and organization of data and metadata. Uh, I won't go into the rest of these in detail, you can see them for yourself, but this is a very useful um, uh, high level view of the, 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 the 21st century skills that are needed. Um, subject domains we've mentioned before, uh, this is important because this is a critical difference between traditional computer science view, if you like, which is predicated on understanding the specialist area of computer science, but rather a mixture of skills beyond that, including statistics, but also the ability to present that in, in uh, a way that relates to other subject domains. And also, this when we talk about data science, we're talking about people who are assisting other people. They're not doing this in their own right as a field to further the world of data science, but rather to support other uh, domains. And this, this is one of the areas that presents quite a bit of um, challenge to, to, to people's worldview, if you like, 
um, on the one hand, you've got data scientists wanting to be, who are assisting people in different domains. On the other hand, you might have specialists within a particular domain who become data scientists in their own right. Uh, and there's, whilst we've modeled the underlying skills, um, there is still some controversy and conjecture about the, the, the balance of these two roles. The, the, the role of the, the data steward goes some way to clarifying that, that um, support role, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a scale that moves from, from the, 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 the supportive to the, the leading role in terms of data science. And this is another perspective on what I've just been talking about and how the different roles, whether it's data scientist, data steward, act as a, as a translator between the domain specific methods and models um, and the, uh, the data science approaches that cut across all of these. Um, and so this sort of model will be used in some kind of organizational planning in terms of seeing what roles are needed to connect the traditional specialists with, with new approaches to data-driven science or indeed business and industrial practices. So what does this mean in the real world? Well, as part of the framework, we developed um, the, the, uh, the competencies and the, these can then be uh, extracted and, and used and developed into uh, training and career development packages. We've already had people who've attended workshops, champions workshops that we've done from universities and businesses who both contributed to the de development of the framework and also made use of this in their own institutions for developing training courses or indeed advising job roles and that, that's really useful and this is the sort of thing that we, we had envisaged would continue to take place after the project ended um, and we, we hope to pursue in the future come back to that later so we have um, a range of professional areas from managers to uh, support workers, which you can read for yourself uh, and understanding what, what the, the components, as you can see on the right, are that make up these professional roles. I won't go into the detail of this slide, but you can see that as the, with the competence framework, you can link those um, more, more fully to existing uh, taxonomies of, of professional roles. And that's something we were keen to, to do um, again, another rather cluttered slide, but what we're really doing is breaking down the, the different elements of what was discovered to the, the big picture that I was talking about earlier. Um, and this enables you to have these more detailed definitions. I don't want to go into the detail, but it's the idea that for each um, area, which profile title, there's, there's uh, metadata that's consistent across these. Uh, and that use of metadata around the um, Profile definitions obviously enables us to have a uh, rigorous structure to the, the development of the framework. Um, so this enables people to start planning or designing uh, training um, processes around this. Um, the, the foundations and the methodological base of training can come from the, the body of knowledge uh, and the model curriculum that have been presented uh, and that can obviously be uh, implemented in, in whatever ways that individuals want to within their organizations or services. Um, the body of knowledge is again broken down into quite low level elements uh, and those in turn can be used to develop uh, teaching material uh, across that, that structure as appropriate for the needs of the organization or, or teams. Um, a bit of background on the sort of things we're looking at in terms of the model curriculum, what were the learning outcomes and how those learning outcomes were linked to learning units. Um, and you can look at the, the model curriculum to understand a bit more about how that worked. And of course, again, we won't go into the actual learning opportunities, but there's obviously uh, rationale behind how this was structured to, to optimize the, the delivery of learning around these data science skills. Uh, some of the approaches to that. Uh, again, I won't go into the, the Bloom's taxonomy, but that was used by the, uh, the people developing the, the model curriculum to, to break down the elements into useful ways. Uh, again, I'll, I'll skip over that one as well. This is just an example in terms of, of the, uh, the knowledge areas, the KAG. So this is the, the terminology used to break down the knowledge 
elements of what we were doing and to map it to some detail of what was needed. Uh, and then a similar example of that there. Um, and then you can see here how those low level learning outcomes uh, uh, knowledge units were put together or reassembled into the, the, the professional profiles um, so that the it enables others to define how they might use professional profiles in their own organization um, based on the framework. And this this diagram, this radar plot, is a very much more visual representation of the, the, the more complex ideas I've just been talking about. So around the outside, you've got the these different low-level elements of, of, of the uh, data science skills that I've mentioned. And then you can use the radar plot to compare for example, a, a job role that you might have in your team or organization uh, with different uh, degrees of uh, requirement for those elements. And then if you have some candidates, you can map what their skills profile is. And that, of course, enables you to, to track what the, the missing elements are uh, and in turn tailor specific training packages within your organization to that individual. So we started within the project to develop some prototypes systems to interrogate uh, through an API the, the content of the framework. Um, fortunately, that's still work in progress, but it would be a work on hold, I should say, to be honest. But I think this would be a really exciting area to, to delve into in the future. Indeed, there could be multiple um, mechanisms for this to enable organizations to um, map people to roles and to uh, identify training needs and decide bespoke training to those services um, and then we looked at the the elements of a data science team and how the the different roles would work together um, and that obviously breaks into that um, the the framework that i discussed at the beginning can then be broken into a lower level and we could develop an api around that to enable other systems to build on the um, the elements within the framework i'm pushing through this quite quickly to try and build a picture but if you look at this slide, and I quickly go to the next slide, what you're seeing is that different roles will be made up of different um, components in different areas. And the, the framework enables those different roles to be uh, defined in quite some detail, but in a consistent way. Um, we, we had the project ended up with some recommendations. I won't read all of these out, um, but there was there was a, uh, an intent that this the framework would be useful to other um, projects and initiatives, uh, as well as being used by universities and businesses. Um, and to degree, this is happening. We've had a lot of interest with universities. Um, a number of these are taking part in future workshops to develop the framework. Uh, and we've also had interest from some quite significant businesses around the world who have, for example, teams of uh, data scientists and are looking to significantly scale up their teams and need to have a a framework to have in order to develop a formal process to, to do that expansion of the teams. So here's uh, just a list of some of the things uh, that are going on. Um, we did talk about a data science manifesto during the early part of the project. We, we, we came up with a, a roadmap and milestones. Um, I think that would still be a great thing to do in terms of the um, driving forwards the, the interest in a, a formalizing of, of data science skills. Um, so what's currently going on is that the team led by uh, Yuri at um, Amsterdam is to work on the next release in the framework. And I'll show you some links at the end if you're interested in being involved in that and some other projects around the world are still looking at this. Um, and there's, there's more work to be done which, which we'd like to uh, somehow develop mechanisms for that to happen. So as I say, my conclusions and actions, all work needed to develop the third release uh, may not be hugely different, but the main thing is to get more involvement, participation. Um, we, we have people operationalizing the framework, professionals, employers, universities, uh, and others, and we're, well, we can, we're supporting that, encouraging that, and I think one of the reasons I was very keen to get involved in this talk is, is to see how the, the, the Dublin Core could be useful to particularly business sectors. So a lot of meetings with people in industry who are using uh, data in, in terms of transforming organizations. 
and having something like the Dublin Core to to find the metadata that needs to be captured in order to make it interoperable, um, I think is a really interesting uh, scenario to, to to further explore. So um, I'd be interesting to explore more of that in the future and, and presenting and preparing this talk has certainly um, awoken my ideas in this area and I think it would be very uh, sort of potential in seeing how Dublin Core Plus data could be used in, in an industrial context to support the transformation around uh, data. So with that I'm saying thank you. Uh, final slide, obviously this, this will be made available through the webinar presentation. Um, the GitHub site is where we're making some information available on the new draft documents if you're interested to see those uh, and um, get in touch if you want to be involved in the work towards refining the next release. Um, the project website is still active, it's still there. Um, use that to put some news out uh, and some contact details for me as well. So with that, I will say thank you and hand back to Paul. Well, thank you very much, Steve, for a, a very uh, in-depth look at um, an area which I think is um, very relevant to a lot of us in, in our day jobs and in our research activities. Um, so I think we, we do have some questions, I believe. Uh, sorry, I'm not used to the system, so bear with me. That's okay, and I, I have to rely on you to uh, put questions to me, Paul. So. Yes, yeah, we have a question. Uh, somebody has asked, I, I'm afraid that I don't know who it is who's asked, it's private, but it says, uh, I'm wondering about how this might fit with the new role academic libraries are taking on as entrepreneurship incubators. Where do you think metadata and metadata education training could fit in for librarians there and thus feed a stronger data-driven workforce training? Wow, that's an excellent question. Um, I like that question. Um, my simple answer is yes. <laughs> so this is not really a yes no question, but um, the idea of uh, incubators um, uh, and co-working spaces, business accelerators interest me greatly, and that's been a separate strand of research I've looked at. Um, I've looked at and visited um, business accelerators, business incubators in, in many cities around the world from London, Edinburgh, Bristol, New York and elsewhere. And I, I can see I like the way different places are repurposing themselves to, to, to support businesses. Um, I like co-working spaces, I like cafes that present people, I like maker spaces. Um, See lots of examples of that. Now, the the best example um, uh, of a library doing this that I have visited is Carnegie Lemon in yeah. Pittsburgh, and that was really uh, up the scale impressive in in terms of um, making space available for people to not just work but to do things. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity that, um, as I mentioned, I've always been a fan of libraries anyway, it works in them. So I think it's really a question of just saying, just doing it, that's that's a bit, that's not, I think the opportunity is there. I think uh, libraries can work with other departments and importantly, importantly, business schools. Business schools have an understanding of the, you know, the process. So whilst working with computer science or engineering departments to uh, explore what tools, 3D, modu 3D modeling, manufacturing, um, laser cutting, etc. Is, is useful, it's the business schools that will have the understanding of, of how startups operate and what their needs are uh, and indeed be able to link to uh, people, individual entrepreneurs within uh, universities. So I think great idea. Uh, and uh, yeah, lots of some good examples around the world already of this happening. Thank you. So we, we have another question, but before we do, I just wanted to pick up on that a little bit. Um, 
so there are um, other organizations developing or already have developed competency frameworks around um, information management, data management, metadata management, and so on. So I, I wonder, um, has there been any uh, direct connection between Edison and organizations such as iSchools, for example? Yes, so we had, uh, a few, we've had a few people from iSchools uh, attend, we've invited, attend our, com our conferences and workshops, we've invited them or we've given talks. Um, and so whilst the project was active, um, we certainly had that both from individuals uh, and um, yeah, the organisation as a whole, if you like. So I think um, there was some interest, there was interest, uh, and that's certainly something to, to pick up on in the future. Uh, and that's a very good point. I think we, I'm sure Yuri will have invited our contacts to the workshop, workshops he's planning, but I'll, I'll certainly make a note of that to, to reinforce that and make sure that takes place because that's, as you say, a very important um, link. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another um, question on a different uh, subject. So um, somebody has asked, or has mentioned that there's been no mention of documentation of data sets or outcomes of data analysis. Are these seen as core competencies in the Edison work? Uh, say, say that again, because I'm not sure there's a the question, the two parts of the question put together. So just, just repeat that as you... Uh, well, there's a, there's a statement that there, there has been no mention of documentation of data sets or outcomes of data analysis. Um, and then the question is, are these seen as core competencies in the Edison work? So documentation of data sets or outcomes of data analysis. Yes, absolutely. That's a good question. And I'm trying to think whether... Obviously, yes, obviously, the ability to document is very important. Uh, having framework guidelines to document would be a very good yeah. idea. Um, off the top of my head, I'm trying to think if there's an, as a elements that do formally okay. capture that. Um, okay. And I'm not sure. So I'll, I'll certainly follow up on that because it's a very good point. I mean, the, the pushback against that is that you can over specify everything. I think one of the things we, we wanted to be in that middle ground of, of pragmatism of the framework in a sense that we wanted to create something that people could do for themselves rather than come up with a list of laws down to that level of you know, this is how documentation should be formatted. Um, so I'm sure that there's elements that would guide that, but I think it's worth, um, I'll certainly yeah. double check that. I'll certainly feed that back to, to Yuri and the others for the next framework next um, workshop to, to work on the next release. I think it's a really good point. Yeah. Explicitly yeah. conveyed, we can make sure that it's, that, you know, the description of the need for that is is, is in there so that people say that these are the, the elements that might, might relate to that. But yeah, very good point. So another question from me, um, there's a, um, you mentioned big data a, a lot, um, and I think a lot of these competencies are around um, science, which is only possible with large, significantly large data sets. Uh, but I wonder about the scope for competencies dealing with small heterogeneous data sets, which is uh, forms another aspect of, of 21st century research. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, um, big data isn't everything. Uh, certainly, one of the uh, one of the great things about this work has been talking to many people in different areas, and there are different schools of thought, and there are you know, quite contentious different schools of thought. So, one of the reasons for having a framework is is to, to try and um, structure that common ground. So, you, you've not just got a common ground between. As, as I mentioned, different domains from astrophysics, geology, whatever, where that's not a good example, but things are perhaps more different in order to have a common framework. In terms of big data, little data, that's a very interesting one. You know, when we've spoken to some statisticians, they would say, well, actually, we prefer, we prefer little data, we prefer small data. We'd rather have a 
the data set that we know exactly what it is and where it's come from. We don't we don't buy into the the, the big data picture, um, especially as used by you know people who are harvesting you know, huge amounts of, for example, Twitter feeds or something like that, and, or you know, Amazon customer data. So they see a significant difference between analysing what has happened in order to have to predict what happens next to actually having small sets of what they would call reliable data to understand why what has happened happened in order to predict what might happen next. So small data is very important indeed. Um, so at that level, uh, different approaches to what we call data science as an umbrella term is significant. And that's why I think the framework uh, presents some degree of abstraction against those uh, belief systems, which are quite significant in order to, to, to harmonize the picture. But no, small data is, is very important, but it's often a very different thing. OK, thank you. Well, I think that there are no more questions. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you very much, Steve, for a, a very detailed um, talk. And uh, we will be making the slides available um, on the uh, the DCMI website yeah. soon, so uh, people will be able to go in and follow those many links um, yeah. and study those uh, complicated diagrams of <laughs> overlapping competencies. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I well, think I'll, thank I'll hand... Thanks for the opportunity to share the work of, you know, as I say, mentioned at the beginning, you know, many people.